Good morning. It's great to be with you this morning for the online worship service of the Pleasant Grove Church of Christ. A few quick announcements before we get started this morning. If you would like to help support the ministry of the Pleasant Grove Church of Christ, you can do so by sending either your tithes or offerings to the address on the screen beside me. You can also find this address at pleasantgrovechurchofchrist.com, along with much, much more for your spiritual growth and development. Life is filled with opportunities. The problem we face is that it's also filled with disappointments masquerading as opportunities. We've all heard this feel about the unheard of riches that can be made through the newest pyramid scheme. Maybe there's maybe we're the ones who have bought into it and are sharing it with a new crop of would-be salesmen and women. But after years in the Avon, Amway, Mary Kay, Pampered Chef, Rodan Fields family, we have yet to see our dreams materialize. And we're left with little more than empty hopes and disappointments. Or maybe it's that game app on our phone that promises big payouts in real money. But we never seem to hit it big. Who could have known that Unlike the ads, not everyone wins at bingo or solitary or blackjack or whatever it may be that we're playing. The only people who are really making it big are the developers and maybe the actors they hire to claim that they've made fortunes if they're not actually using the app. The difficult part is not missing the tree of opportunity amid the forest of disappointment. We've likely all missed out on something truly special because we simply didn't know what it was until it was too late. Many of you know that I enjoy putting together Legos. But did you know that there's actually money to be made in the buying and selling of Legos? This past Christmas, I was at my brother's house for the holiday, and it was a fairly laid-back day, so I was perusing Facebook Marketplace, and I came across a listing of 35 pounds of Legos for $150. I thought it seemed like a good deal, but I wasn't quite sure I wanted to pull the trigger and actually buy them. I mentioned it to my nephew, who promptly said, that he would buy them if I would pick them up for him. The little entrepreneur had grandiose plans to resell them as individual sets on eBay. And when I picked them up for him, I began to realize the opportunity that I had missed out on. The first set that my nephew sold, he recouped his entire initial investment. And that wasn't even the set that he was excited that was included in it. I missed out on something special because I didn't know what it was until it was too late. Unfortunately, myriads of people have come and gone from this life never understanding the importance of God's blessing. They've seen what God offers in Christ but considered it just another pyramid scheme or another payout app. And they missed out on the real life and heavenly rewards that God offers. In Genesis chapters 27 and 28, Esau missed out. But his story really began back in Genesis chapter 25 at his birth. Abraham's son Isaac had met and married Rebekah when he was 40 years old. Like his parents, they struggled to conceive. For 20 years, they were childless. Recognizing his wife's longing for a child, Isaac prayed for her, and the Lord answered his prayer, and she became pregnant. During the pregnancy, 
She felt that something strange was happening, and she was, she was concerned. The babies were jostling with each other within her, but she didn't know what was happening. There was actually no way for her to know that there were two babies within her womb. Having never been pregnant myself, I don't know what it's like to have something living inside of me that I have no control over. But my wife Annie describes it as an alien that you fully expect to claw its way out of your chest at some point. Maybe she watched a few too many scary movies as a child, and she was only carrying one baby at the time. Rebecca was carrying twins that were into wrestling with no way of knowing that there were twins there. The Lord reassured her of what was happening, explaining to her in Genesis chapter 25, verse 23. Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When it was time to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The firstborn was covered in hair, so they decided to name him Esau, meaning Harry. The secondborn came out holding the firstborn's heel, so they named him Jacob, meaning heel grabber. As the boys grew, Esau became a skillful hunter, a real man's man, while Jacob was content being at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. One day when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country and he was famished. Esau asked his brother for some of the stew. But Jacob told him that he would only give him some of the stew in exchange for Esau's birthright. Now, I'm not sure if Jacob had sinister intent at this point. I imagine Jacob jokingly saying, Give me me your birthright. I'm only kidding. Unless you'll actually do it, in which case I am deadly serious. Unless you won't, in which case I'm just kidding unless you'll do it. Esau reasoned to himself that he would starve to death if he didn't eat, and what good was his birthright to him then? He agreed, and Jacob gave him some bread and some of the lentil stew. Esau ate and drank, and he got up and left. And Moses concludes the story with one more phrase in Genesis chapter 25, verse 34. So Esau despised his birthright. Leaping ahead to Genesis chapters 27 and 28, the boys were no longer boys, but men in their 40s. Their father Isaac was old and his eyesight was beginning to fail and recognizing his own mortality, he called for Esau, the son that he loved, and told him to go out hunting and then prepare some of the wild game that he had killed for him the way that he liked it. And finally, he would bless his son before he died. Now his wife, Rebecca, was listening in. And she told Jacob, her favorite son, her plan to deceive Isaac into giving him the blessing instead of Esau. Jacob was to go out to the field and bring two young goats to her for her to prepare the way that Isaac liked. And then Jacob was to take the meal to Isaac and steal the blessing. We might wonder what the big deal was about getting the blessing. I mean, Esau had already traded his birthright as the firstborn for a bowl of lentil stew, a birthright that entitled Jacob to a double portion of the inheritance from his father. What more could he ask? The blessing of a father could overrule one's birthright. 
Generally, the eldest son would receive both the birthright and the blessing, but occasionally a father would bless the younger son, thus nullifying the elder son's birthright. In Jacob's case, his father, his father's blessing of Esau could have undone Esau's flippant treatment of his birthright, thus placing him once again in the greater portion of the inheritance. With little coaxing, Jacob did as his mother told him, and she prepared the meal. Then she took Esau's best clothes and put them on Jacob, along with the goat skins, to mimic Esau's hairy arms and neck. With his disguise firmly in place, Jacob took the tasty meal and went to his father. Isaac had his suspicions, though. First, he questioned how Esau could have been successful in his quest so soon, to which Jacob told his father that Isaac's God had given him success. This phrasing that Jacob uses has always been interesting to me because apparently, even at age 40, Jacob had yet to come into his own faith in God still referring to the Lord as the God of his father. Next, Isaac questioned Jacob's voice. And after touching the goat's hair on his arms, and Isaac still had his doubts. But finally, Isaac had Jacob bring him the meal that his mother had prepared and the wine that she had sent, still not actually realizing that it wasn't Esau and smelling the odor of Esau's clothing. As he kissed his son, Isaac was convinced and pronounced his blessing. In Genesis chapter 27, verses 27 through 29. Ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you heaven's dew and earth's richness an abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you, and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers, and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed, and those who bless you be blessed. After Isaac had finished blessing Jacob unknowingly, and Jacob had left, Esau returned from hunting. He too prepared some tasty food for his father and brought it to him. And when he told his father to sit up and eat some of the game that he had prepared for him, Jacob's deception came to light. Realizing what had happened and that it couldn't be undone, Isaac began to shake violently. Seeing his father's response and hearing his words, Esau pleaded with tears that his father would bless him as well. But Isaac explained that he had already proclaimed Jacob Lord over him. What else was there to give? Pleading for anything, Isaac blessed Esau, though it was almost a curse. In Genesis chapter 27, verses 39 and 40. Your dwelling will be away from the earth's richness, away from the dew of heaven above. You will live by the sword and you will serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you will throw his yoke from off your neck. That day Esau took up a grudge against his brother, planning to kill Jacob after his father's death. When Rebekah heard what he was planning, she told Jacob to flee to her brother Laban under the guise that he would find a wife. He actually found two. Rebekah told Isaac that she was disgusted with the women of Canaan and that she wanted Jacob to go to her homeland to marry. He agreed and gave Jacob his blessing to go and he sent him off and it would be years before his return. 
On his way to his uncle, he reached a certain place, and stopping for the night, he took one of the stones there, and he put it under his head, and he lay down to sleep. As he slept, he dreamed of a stairway stretching from heaven with the angels ascending and descending on it. Above the stairway stood the Lord, and he said in Genesis chapter 28, verses 13 to 15, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke, he praised the Lord. Then he took the stone he had under his head, and he set it up as a pillar and anointed it with oil. He called that place Bethel, and he vowed that the Lord would be his God if he would watch over him, care for him, and one day bring him back to his father's house. Jacob's vow is in stark contrast with Esau's flippant treatment of his birthright and his father's blessing. Jacob recognized the significance of this isolated moment in his life. It was the moment the God of his fathers would become his Lord, and his life would forever be changed. Esau, on the other hand, failed to recognize the significance of his birthright and his father's blessing. In turn, he missed out on God's blessing as well. The promise that was first given to his grandfather Abraham and then to his father Isaac was given to his brother Jacob, who took hold of the blessing of God. The writer of Hebrews put it this way in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 through 17. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. Esau took his eyes off God, preferring the momentary gratification of his own physical desires. And he missed out on something special because he didn't know what it was until it was too late. Just like many who miss out on God's blessing found in Jesus. In Matthew chapter 21, Jesus told a parable about a landowner who had planted a vineyard and then rented it to some farmers and moved to another place. When it was time for the harvest, he sent his servants to collect his portion of the fruit. But one after another, they seized his servants, mistreating them. And finally, he sent his son. But they took him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Jesus asked the crowd what the owner will do when he returns himself. And the crowd replied that, He will bring those wretches to a wretched end and rent the vineyard to others who will give him his rightful share. In Matthew chapter 21, verses 42 to 44, Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. 
Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. Instead of a blessing, they would receive a curse. And in the next verses we read, When the chief priest and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. They had Jesus right there with them, but they missed him. They missed who he is and the blessing that that is found in him because they took their eyes off God, preferring to fix them on their own desires, their own way of thinking. Many in the world, and unfortunately many in the church, have lost sight of God and missed the blessing found in Jesus because they preferred to do things their own way. Sometimes stuck in the way things have always been done, that falls short of God's blessing. Other times, pressing for change that takes them away from God's core desire for them. We mustn't be like Esau, who missed out on something special because he didn't recognize what God was really offering. In Jesus, God offers us a new beginning, a new life in Him, not confined by our worldly desires or the way things have always been, but set free to love and be loved by God. My challenge for you this week is to take hold of the blessing of God found in Jesus, living according to His Word, experiencing the God-filled life that he has for you. The life God has for us in Jesus is better than anything we can plan for ourselves. May we live each day in the light of God's blessing found in Christ. This brings us to a time of communion a time when we share together with Christ as well as with one another in Christ. And today I'd like to read a passage of Scripture from 1 John chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. I share this passage with you because it talks of our allegiance Our allegiance to God and a righteous life, or our allegiance to the devil and a sinful life. God tells us in this passage through John that his children will live a righteous life. He fills them with his spirit, and as we live according to that spirit, We live to please our Heavenly Father. It says anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who 
does not love their brother and sister. These are some of the core things of our faith. That we must do what is right. What God has written to us in his word. What's implied there is that we know his word. We get into his word. We, we fill our lives with his word, his desire for us. And the natural outcome of his word living within us is that we love God and we love our brothers and sisters in Christ. What's sad is that sometimes we struggle with these, these most basic of principles. And yet, in Christ, we can be forgiven. Through his sacrifice on the cross, we can have a new start, live a new life. We can live differently because of Jesus in our lives. The blessing of God. Let's partake of the bread which helps us to remember the broken body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He went to the cross to bring, bring about our forgiveness, bring us back into relationship with our Heavenly Father. Let's partake. And now, the juice, which represents his shed blood there on the cross, bringing about our forgiveness sins, allowing us to have that fresh start, that new life in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that we are able to be here together and to be able to share in communion together with one another. And Father, may we be encouraged by your words, that they would fill us with new life, that they would help us to live transformed for Christ. And Father, we thank you that he has come to this place, he has laid down his life for each of us and brought about our new life in him. We thank you that we are able to live differently because of Jesus' Holy Spirit within us. And Father, we thank you and we pray these things in your Son's name, Jesus. Amen. I thank you for the opportunity of gathering together with you today to unfold the scriptures for you. And I look forward to the next time we're able to be together, either in person in southeast Minnesota at Pleasant Grove Church of Christ, beginning with our Sunday school hour at 9.30 each Sunday, immediately followed by our worship hour at 10.30. Or, once again, right back here online, as we gather together to worship at 11 a.m. on our Facebook page and reposted on our YouTube channel as well as our website the Pleasant Grove Church of Christ dot com. I thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I look forward to the next time. God bless and stay well.